Well, first of all, Huladunia Svalche, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Justice Subcommittee on Policing. This is our seventh meeting of 2018, and we have no apologies. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private, um, which is a dis uh, discussion on uh, the subcommittee's work programme. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, our next item, uh, agenda item two, is the Police Scotland's firearms licensing process. And it's, a, it's an evidence ses session, and I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private question, uh, a private paper. And I welcome Superintendent Ronnie McGoughan. Uh, um, National Firearms and Explosives Licensing, Safer Communities, Police Scotland, and Drew Livingston, Service Conditions Officer, Unison Police Staff, Scotland Branch. You're yeah, both very welcome, and thank you for the written submissions, which are always helpful to members in advance. And we'll move straight to questions, and um, Daniel, you have some... Oh, oh, sorry, beg your pardon. Yeah, Liam, and then Daniel. Yes. Yeah, thanks, uh, Convener. Good afternoon. I just wonder whether you might be able to... Um, kick off with a general description of the, the, the processes and the procedures around how firearms uh, applications are handled. Yeah, certainly. So in terms of what's now um, the system in Scotland, clearly we had, we've had firearms and shotgun certificates for a significant period of time. And then with the legislation that came in um, in 2016, we added air weapons in Scotland to that certification process. Um, they're very, very similar. There are, there are slight differences in terms of air weapon process. Um, but an application submitted, it's, it's drawn down online, it's submitted in physical form, um, it goes through a number of checks. So there are a number of background checks, clearly, as you would expect to be done on the applicant. Uh, there's a fee paid for that. Um, and it goes out in the initial case of a grant, so an initial first time round certificate, or a renewal, so an existing certificate holder who wishes to renew that at point of expiry. That goes out to a local policing division where inquiry is carried out and invariably that will be an engagement between a police officer or a member of police staff who are conducting those firearms inquiries um, to engage with the individual um, and to establish that we're satisfied around about matters of security, how the weapons are stored, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, once all of that process is complete, um, then it comes back into a central administration team who initiated the whole process and the certificate is then issued from a central position. So in, in a very potted way, that, that's the application and issue process within Scotland. And I mean, I appreciate what you say about the, the, the change as a result of air weapons being brought within the ambit of this process um, in recent times. What's Generally, what's the, the, the kind of figures uh, of, of applications that are made that are um, uh, that are then granted and and the geographical spread of that? Okay. In terms of the situation we've now got in Scotland, so in terms of numbers, the, the certificate holders across Scotland is 70,656. 50,696 of those are firearms or shotgun certificate holders and 19,960 are air weapons. Um, those details are about a couple of months old, so those will have increased during that period of time. Um, in terms of the numbers currently we experience, so the way that firearms and shotgun certificates manifest, and this is due to the implementation back in time in terms of the requirement for a certificate, is we have a fluctuating demand. So we have a three-year period where we have a gradual increase to very high demand, and then we have a two-year trough um, where demand is very low. Um, so the demand clearly fluctuates to, throughout that period. Just as an example for you in terms of what we're currently experiencing, we have about 150 applications per month in terms of firearms and shotguns and about 100 uh, for rear weapons. So those are for new grants. And then we have clearly a projected um, figure for renewals because we can put an accurate figure on those because we know the numbers of existing uh, firearm certificate holders. In terms of that geographical spread, um, the significant numbers in terms of geography are in the north northeast um, and also in Lothian and Scottish Borders Division. So th those are the heaviest in terms of the numbers of certificate holders. And has that pattern really changed at all over the years? Is it? No, that's very much consistent with what it was back in the Legacy Force situation. Uh, and part of that is, is due to the demographics of those areas. Um, so, yeah, it hasn't and, changed. I mean, I appreciate that the, the, the air weapons component of the figures you've given, um, there's not going to be comparable data going back um, any distance. The firearms, shotguns, uh, numbers, uh, again, what's been the kind of trend of that over, over the last kind of decade? And, and 
it, so. it stayed fairly constant. That there is a slight increase, but it, but it's not an enormous increase. I mean, certainly the, at the point where um, the air weapons licensing came <coughs> in, one of the points <coughs> being made by those who had concerns about that yeah. was that, in a sense, if you had a process for air weapons um, licensing uh, that was as bureaucratic as that for firearm shotguns, um, you may see um, people moving from, from air weapons <coughs> to shotguns. Is there any uh, indication in the figures you've outlined that suggests that, that that's happened at, at, to any extent? No, I mean, what we're actually finding is that we've actually got firearms and shotgun certificate holders who now possess air weapons as well, and we try to align the certification period to the expiry for all of those certificates. I think uh, my experience of it, it's a slightly different demographic um, who have made applications for rare weapon certificates. Um, now, that's a, a generalisation on my part, but that's the sense that I get. It's a different grouping of people, because clearly the possession of rare weapons in many occasions is for a different purpose. Um, and one of the, the stipulations within certainly the firearms uh, and shotgun certificate process is that you need to provide good reason for actually the possession and use of them. So. Mm. I, again, one of the other concerns yeah. around the time with the, the air weapons uh, certification or licensing scheme coming in w was about that issue you referred to before, where there's there's kind of peaks in demand and, and that this was going to exacerbate that, that peak. Certainly, I know from a constituency level, there were time delays um, in, in, in turning around applications that you could, you could almost predict. Is that managed to any great extent more efficiently perhaps than it had been before? Yeah, man, most definitely. I mean, the, 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 the luxury that we have, I suppose, in terms of fair weapon um, licensing is the it's legislation uh, which was created in Scotland. Um, clearly, in terms of the firearms and the shotgun certification process, it's under the Firearms Act uh, in 1968 and the subsequent amendments, and the Home Office effectively dictate the guidance and the practice in terms of that. Uh, what we've managed to do in terms of air weapon licensing is that we've managed to stagger renewals. Um, so that's been a very busy and industrious period for us um, since the implementation of the legislation. But it's now put us in a position where we've effectively flatlined that demand. Um, that's a position we would love to get to in terms of firearms and shotguns as well. Because clearly for resourcing purposes, um, having a demand which effectively is steady from now um, moving forwards uh, actually allows you to provide a resource model um, which clearly doesn't have to accommodate those fluctuations. And is there any way, that, I mean, notwithstanding the point you make about where the, the kind of genesis of the legislation, yep. is there any way in which you can move towards more of a kind of smoothed out application <coughs> process for firearms and shotguns? Not, not without Home Office approval to do it, clearly, but um, there is a growing appetite. Uh, every, every force down south, and I have regular contact with them. Um, so in England and Wales, the same situation arises. We're in this period of you know, high demand followed by a period uh, of low demand, and that presents the same challenges for everybody in terms of how you best resource that. Now, projecting forward to your high demand, because the vast majority of it's coming from renewals, it is fairly easy, but then it's what you do with those resources when you get into a period of low demand. How do you then efficiently utilise those resources how do you pr provide best value in terms of those resources? And that's the significant challenge. Right. I think we're going to come on to that. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Indeed. Stuart, I think um, you're next. Uh, with yes, just to help us understand uh, about resources, I wonder if uh, perhaps Drew Livingston, give him the chance to participate here, um, could describe the roles undertaken by administration staff and how they fit with and differentiate uh, uh, from the inquiries officers that are, who are uniformed? Yeah, um, from what I could gather, the administrative function would deal with more the, the kind of processing of applications where the inquiry officers would actually go out into the field and attend addresses and check premises and ensure that the firearms would be checked and um, kept in facilities which were in accordance with legislation and would ensure that firearms couldn't actually be uh, stolen or acquired by other individuals and also ensure that the individuals with those weapons are fit and proper individuals to be holding those weapons. Um, I, I thought I heard, and I may have mis misheard or chosen to mishear uh, what uh, the superintendent said, that there were some civilians 
made visits to assess. Uh, I'm getting a nod. So is that uh, the Unison staff that are uh, the uh, the administration staff? Do they also um, participate in that? No. Um, <coughs> there are, following the Cullen report in some parts of Scotland, we had um, firearms inquiry officers that were actually employed by certain specific police divisions pre-merger, and that, that carried on into Police Scotland. And what happened was um, the business decided to review exactly how that work would be conducted and decided that they didn't need as many civilian firearms inquiry officers. And so some of those individuals or posts were made redundant. Um, and they would compensate for that with a more flexible deployment model, which would actually mean that divisional police resources, community officers, would have to then fill that 10% of their time would be spent on firearms inquiries. So the, uh, the, the administration staff that are involved in firearms during the, the, the two years when there appears to be law demand are doing other activities, one yeah. must yeah. logically yes. assume. Mm -hmm. And in particular, uh, Superintendent, how does the, uh, uh, the, the, the balance between these two sets of resources in terms, of, in terms of numbers, so the administrative um, provision, which is entirely uh, as described, uh, which does the processing elements of the, the certification process, um, there are 30 administrators and there are three member, members of police staff coordinators, and they are um, based um, on a hub basis uh, at different regions around about Scotland. And then at the time of... Um, the review of the structure, and the first iteration and then the following iterations up to implementation of the new model in 2015, there was a reduction in member of police staff, full-time firearms inquiry officers. That was reduced to 14 um, in 2015. Um, and that's supplemented, as, as uh, Drew has said, that's supplemented now um, by police officers who, who are carrying out the inquiry part of it in their communities. Now, you, you've indicated the numbers of uh, certificate holders is rising a bit. Um, how are the costs? Because uh, part of the justification <coughs> for the National Police Service was increased efficiency and uh, increased <coughs> improved outcomes through standardisation of approach. How is that working uh, in, in this area? Is the national model delivering uh, what is expected to deliver? In terms of the, 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 the clinical costs that were laid down in paper, um, back in 2015, the point of implementation, um, were undoubtedly achieved because there was a removal. So we had at that time 33 full-time um, member of police staff civilian uh, inquiry officer posts, and they were reduced to 14. And in effect, that's how the calculation was done. So we removed that number and we had a figure um, that came from that. And that was what was presented as the savings. Um, now, in reality, some of that work clearly, as, as described, went over to, and the intention, full intention at that time, was for it to go over to community officers within communities in Scotland, because there was a natural logic in terms of that, um, and it was to allow flexibility. So the intention was never that those police officers became full-time firearms inquiry officers. Um, has had or did exist in the legacy forces, so there were a number of full-time um, police officer, firearms inquiry officers, the intention was that they would be flexible in terms of their approach. And the rationale behind that was to deal with that fluctuation that I described earlier. So the, the number of full-time civilian firearms inquiry officers meant that there would be a surplus during the period of low demand. And it was viewed at that time that the most efficient use of resource was to take the baseline figure so the number that was required of civilian firearms inquiry officers for low demand and then supplement that with police officers to deal with the increased demand during the periods of high demand. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel, I, I know you were to come in next, but Margaret's got a question that follows on from this, I think. That would be the good yes, it was Thanks. on the, um, of these inquiry officers and the fact that they had been staff, police staff in the past. And I noticed from the Unison submission that um, 
you see the fire, firearms licensing process as they are currently stand are not entirely effective and certainly not efficient, and there's simply no good reason why the function of firearms inquiry, uh, inquiry officers should um, not be carried out by police staff. Could you elaborate, and, uh, Mr Livingston, why it's not effective or efficiently in, in your view as it stands? Yes. Um, prior to the structure being implemented in 2015, we became aware um, through attendance at a divisional meeting. It would be a miss of me to specify which policing division it was. But at a divisional level, there was an intention from that division who were concerned about the removal of a number of police uh, staff, um, civilian firearms inquiry officers, um, that they would be unable to cope with the demand. So what they then did, um, prior to the, the structure being implemented, was advertise for police officers to apply for full-time postings within the structure, which wasn't presented in the initial business case. Um, they then changed the name so that it, they would be they would become firearms licensing coordinators and they would actually adopt a couple of different tasks and primarily that was so that it wouldn't be seen as backfilling. Now that wasn't the picture right across Scotland but it was certainly the picture in a couple of different local policing divisions and we're aware that that's still happening. So in effect it, it has been backfilling on a permanent basis? Yes. Uh -huh. And in terms, I mean this was supposed to be a cost saving method and you know obviously you you look at cost saving and you look at efficiency and effectiveness and these have to be weighed up but if it was being advertised as police officers have you any um kind of figures to to say that this was actually costing more than it was um when it was previously done by police staff um we're uncertain and um, we don't have sight of that we've raised challenges at a number of different levels within the organization and also with the spa um, prior to the the business case being approved by the board, it was was it the twenty? I can't remember the date. It was the twenty fifth of August, I believe, but, or twenty seventh of August. It was the day Stephen House resigned. But certainly, that was the day that the board was due to implement the structure, and we'd notified the board prior to that to make them aware of what was happening. That the structure wasn't as it was being advertised, mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't the structure that had been consulted with with the staff who were affected. Um, and I notice you have come considerable concern that no con it was never raised at that board member, no concern was no. expressed, Your, um, the points you raised weren't looked at and the HMICS um, then goes on to, to criticise very much the fact that SPA seemed to have stood aside and done nothing to inquire and uh, to look for more information or and um, to ask how the the process is working if i could just convene and ask um mr mclaughlin hmi uh, cs also says uh, that they would have expected police scotland to be reporting to the spa of ways in which the model as approved has not been implemented. Has that been done? Because we're looking at the efficiency and the effectiveness, which seems to me to go to the core of whether police staff could quite easily have done that. In fact, done it perhaps more efficiently. Yeah, and I, I think the, the, the issue fundamentally that, that was um, presented to the project team who, who developed this current model was very much that issue around about the fluctuating period. So just to explain, in terms of the 30 administrative staff, What's happened during this period of low demand is they've utilised that to effectively remove all of our backlog of paper records, of uploading old records onto the now national uh, firearms IT system, etc. So they've, they've been utilised to, to, to a great degree of effect during this period of low demand. Um, now, could that have happened for full-time civilian firearm inquiry officers? Actually, there was a rigidity around about their role profile at that time, um, which meant that it would have been very challenging and very difficult to find alternative roles or alternative functions for those individuals during a period of low demand. Um, and that's why they opted for the model of taking a baseline, which serviced the low period of demand, and complementing that with police officers. The intention was never 
and it's never stated in any of the documentation that was presented that they should be full time within that role, but it should be part of a flexible approach. And the initial number that was, that was put forward was 185 police officers to be trained who went through a three day course in firearms inquiries. And the 185 was, as individual numbers, was way above what was required, but it afforded that flexibility. So that, um, put against the geography of Scotland and the diversity of each of the local policing divisions, was considered the best number to start with. Now, clearly from HMICS report, that number has increased in terms of the number who have been trained. But again, in the documentation that was uh, presented, both internally to governance uh, regime within Police Scotland and SBA, suggested that that was actually a natural logic that you would increase the number of trained police officers because that increased the flexibility. On the flexibility point and the police staff point, uh, Mr Livingston, can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, we had a, a business case and a structure which was presented to the trade unions as part of meaningful consultation. In actual fact, they delivered a structure which wasn't meaningful because it didn't bear any resemblance to what was actually implemented. And that, that, that provi provides and presents its own challenges. Um, you know, if you're presented with something saying that we need to make X numbers of police staff redundant, then you kind of expect that that will be borne out in how the structure will relate to that in future. But it's not. You've just replaced you've them with full time with police officers. Police officers. That's certainly a matter of concern, something I would have expected the SPA to be picking up on. And if I could just comment, and it is just a comment, I understand their meeting as a, the SPA as a board meeting today. I would still have expected someone to be here answering the very con serious concerns that have been raised um, about this issue. I'll let others get in. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Uh, ben. Uh, ben. Daniel, I beg your pardon. Oh, Dan and Ben go <laughs> together. Um, thank you, convener. So, uh, first of all, can I just thank Drew Livingston and Unison, I think, for, for flagging uh, you know, this issue to us. I think it's, it was a very useful uh, opportunity to do so. But the key issue that seems to be at stake here, and, and that highlighted by HMICS report, is how the implementation of this new model has actually taken place as compared to the, the, the plan. And I think critical to that is when you look at the, the point you just mentioned there, which is the, the fact that the plan was that 350 police officers would be trained, and we now have a, a, a thousand um, supported by 14 civilian staff, which I think is the, the, the critical issue. Can you just explain, you just said that a thousand was a, a natural result of the implementation of this plan. Well, why, why was the 350 figure used then if that wasn't the natural expectation? No, I, I, I think in, in reality, a 1,000 is way beyond the expectation. Right. I think initially it was 185, it, it went to 350, which was probably quite reasonable. I, I think the issue around about implementation um, comes from the point that there perhaps wasn't enough cognizance taken of geographical differences, and there perhaps wasn't enough autonomy provided around about how um, the service is provided um, within the structure of local policing. Um, and I, for one, having responsibility for moving forward the recommendations within the HMICS report, certainly welcome the recommendation um, that outlines that you know, national standards, so service standards, should be defined and published. And then with the degree of localism and the focus of localism within Police Scotland moving forwards, that perhaps the best model, and it will be subject to, to review clearly, but perhaps the best model is allowing that autonomy at a local level to decide on how best that service can be delivered. Um, and I think everybody would accept that with the initial plan in 2013 and the iterations that came thereafter, it was very much a single model driven from the centre. Um, but that is not the same as the, the current approach or culture within Police Scotland. So, you know, as an organisation, clearly we have grown and we've matured during that period. Uh, and I think the focus on localism within 2026 um, takes us to a very good point in terms of how that service can be delivered in the most efficient and effective way moving forwards. Remember, at the point of implementation by, or, or agreement for implementation by SPA, there was a review period was placed on it. And it was subject or caveated that there should be, within a two-year period, a review conducted on the effectiveness of it. Now, 
I wasn't in post, but my understanding is that was that was stalled because we knew the HMICS inspection was coming. So, so rather than start a review process internally, allow HMICS to carry out that inspection. And I think what it clearly highlights is that we now need to look at demand. We need to look at demand nationally. We need to look at demand locally. And we do need to develop a model which provides the most efficient and effective firearms licensing for Scotland not just from the point of view of the public purse, but clearly from those customers who pay for that service as well. Okay. So just following up, and I think on two of the important points you've just made there around national standards and about localisation, you know, just <coughs> follow up on both of those, taking them in turn. First of all, on standardisation, is that work to develop and implement national standards, is that work underway? <coughs> and, and when will those standards be ready for, for yes. rollout? It is underway. In terms of a number of these recommendations, <clears throat> um, they are underway already. So around about the performance framework, there's already a significant amount of work that's ongoing in terms of that. And the standards very much align to the performance framework. So in terms of the standards, um, we've always had some in place. Um, so the 16-week renewal period, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, 16-week period for renewals, um, of which we hit 99% success in terms of those. Um, we have a same, we have internal targets which we aim for in terms of our standards, which we aim for in terms of our, our business. But as HMICS has clearly highlighted, those should be published. Mm -hmm. So as a customer within the service, then clearly you should understand the agreement that Police Scotland's entering into. So if you're a new applicant, what can your expectation be? what's reasonable in terms of the turnaround of that application. If you're renewing or you're submitting a request for a variation, what's the reasonable time period that you should expect? And I, I think that degree of transparency is entirely achievable and is entirely um, appropriate um, given the nature of the service we deliver. So those work is already underway in terms of that, yes. And, and when will that work conclude? When do you expect to roll out? Well, we've got 23 standards? recommendations, and there are varying timescales um, in terms of the achievement of each one of those. Um, the performance framework, I would have to say, is moving along particularly well. Mm -hmm. um, Police Scotland are developing a framework for policing uh, in terms of performance just now, and we've managed to um, benefit from the assistance um, of um, expertise that's, that's in the force doing that just now. So if everything goes according to that plan, we will have a performance framework within the next three to six months, absolutely. Um, and I could publish standards. I could, I could publish standards tomorrow. But the reality of that is, until my performance framework is in place, I've actually got no mechanism by which to gather the information that says I'm achieving or I'm not achieving. But actually, more importantly for me, is if I'm not achieving, why is the business not achieving that? And how, what do we need to change in terms of that? So, uh, and then on the on the point of, sort of local divisions, and first of all, can I just say, I mean, I think I, I, I welcome kind of commitments to, uh, you know, I, I think uh, empower divisional commanders to apply uh, policing policies uh, in a way that's relevant to the local circumstances. I think that's very important. But I, I mean, I understand one of the key issues here is that some local divisions have ended up creating sort of essentially standing specialist units to look at firearms licensing. And that's one of the key drivers behind the, the fact that, that we now have a, a thousand officers that have been trained around 350. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I think clearly what we have across Scotland is very much uh, a patchwork quilt in terms of how those inquiries are, are, are conducted. So yes, um, some divisions have taken a smaller number of people um, who have become more focused and that's become a greater part of the role. Now, there are upsides to that in terms of once the skills have been acquired through the training course, then they're actually um, assessed in terms of their competency throughout a 12-month period, um, and that process is much easier because you're doing more. Um, so there is, there is an upside to actually um, basing it on that, on that way. But I suppose flexibility is ultimately what this is about. So... Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, and it's not. It's not my role to prescribe to local policing how they do that going forwards. Once we've actually got into the process of looking at that full demand and carrying out a review of how we deliver the service, and clearly within HMICS, there's a recommendation for us to do that to look at adequately and efficiently and appropriately resourcing 
firearms inquiries, because these are two very different entities. The administrative part of it is very much a function which is centralised and is actually most efficient in that way. And then the inquiry part, which involves engagement uh, with service users, is the critical part in terms of how local policing delivers that. So, I mean, I think that the, the, the big variance, both in terms of how it's been implemented and just in terms of the sheer numbers, would certainly point to a sort of a, a lack of planning or certainly taking those things into account. And indeed, the HMICS report, and I quote, said that, that, that um, license, the, the new uh, model was uh, inadequately evidenced and insufficiently consulted upon within Police Scotland and externally. I, I'm just wondering if you would agree with that, that point and what, what are you now doing differently in terms of developing new standards you know, go, going forward? And I, I think there is an absolute recognition that the, the demand profile um, that was used in terms of um, developing a resource model was relatively um, basic in its nature. Um, so it looked at uh, a linear function or a linear process and it more or less counted the hours equivalent to people in terms of how much it took to do each one of those. Now, firearms inquiries are far more complex in nature than that. Um, there are peripheral issues that wrap around that linear process and some of that wasn't taken into account at the time. So yeah, the new demand profile, and it will, it will have to be based around about a properly completed and, and, and a you know, fully assessed demand profile. Well, I absolutely believe will pull out far more and stronger evidence than, than was, was there in the first instance. So, so Mr Livingston, can I just ask you to reflect on, on some of those points? I mean, first of all, why do you think we've ended up so far away from the, the original model? And, and most importantly, on that point around consultation, you know, what are Unison's thoughts about both the level of consultation that happened, but also has that changed? Has that improved? Has that lesson been learned? Um, on, the, on that particular issue, I think it's no coincidence that this was one of the last structures which came forward under the Stephen House era within Police Scotland. I think when we started to see um, the business actually try to apply flexible deployment models, another such model was um, the removal of citations officers. Now, most of that work then passed to divisional policing and the divisional coordination unit would then have to resource that. The ethos was very, very similar, that police officers will be able to carry that out. 10% of their duties, you know, over such a period of time, that will equate to each officer conducting two inquiries a week and handing out citations, two citations a week. The reality was the figures that were actually presented were based on, I think it was central Glasgow. Now, obviously, the ge geography there um, is somewhat different. You've got a large number of commercial premises, so police officers would go in and hand out perhaps four citations to a variety of different people. So the logic which was being applied wasn't suitable or applicable to the, the whole of Scotland. So we have a similar kind of issue within the firearms licensing structure where it was based on very, very optimistic projections as to levels of failure demand as well within that. If you consider citations, police staff can actually go to addresses and access them more readily because people who have citations out for them know that they're not going to be apprehended the minute they open the door to a police officer. So therefore, police staff can actually attend the address and access it easier than police officers because police officers they're on the risk of being apprehended by them so the number of repeat journeys that police officers would then have to make to those addresses is factored in in a way with um, firearms inquiries there are similar sorts of challenges regarding demand failure one of the issues that people are making us aware of and our members are still operating within that structure is that there's a poor flow of information in terms of what applicants actually require to supply to them. So an experienced police staff firearms inquiry officer mm. will know that the individual has to have their application and their photograph ready when they go out. Um, we're having issues where police officers attend those addresses and that material isn't ready for them. So the inquiries then take longer or they then have to make repeat journeys. There's a wider issue there as well in terms of... We we keep hearing that 
uh, the, the business requires a flexible deployment model and the ability to flex resources and demand. One of the consequences of that is that structures then lack stability. One of the issues that we raise frequently is the level of transience of police officers within policing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, you don't have an officer that's going to serve as a community officer for 10, 15, 20 years, they may decide to take up other opportunities within policing, which may see them redeployed. That then has consequences in terms of how staff then have to engage with those individuals internally, but also to wider stakeholders also. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, Rona. <laughs> Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, I was a lot of what I was going to say has really been, been touched on, but I just wondered, um, Drew Livingston, if I could ask you um, what your thoughts are on, you know, the, the ongoing changes that have been made, the command profile performance network. Do you think that's the performance framework, rather? Do you think this is going to um, solve problems that were there at the outset? Um, I, I think. Certainly some of the feedback that we're getting from our members is, is very constructive. I think um, particularly issues around GP mandating and, and some of these national processes are actually very, very good and provide a solid platform which actually reduces risk. Our big concern is the, the level of transience and, and fluidity of officers within the organisation and whether that actually addresses people having the prerequisite skills knowledge and experience and also consistency to actually engage with the wider um, public and particularly those license holders and that was certainly an issue and a theme which came through in the HMICS report. Mm -hmm. Would you like to comment on that Superintendent? Yes I mean I, I, as I've said you know I think that the, the numbers that we reached in terms of those trained was never envisaged to that level and absolutely it's not uh, it's not unique to firearms licensing it's prevalent across many areas of policing where you do have transients, so you have people who move on. Um, they're, they're given training in terms of skills for one role, <coughs> and then they move on. And, and some of that absolutely needs to happen because we need to develop our people, um, because ultimately they, they are our most important um, asset uh, and those who serve uh, communities. Um, I, I think going forward, as I've said, you know, part of the the action plan or the improvement plan that comes from the 23 recommendations is to look at do we currently have the best model? Is that the most efficient and effective way to utilise our resources and to provide a service for the public? Um, but most importantly, is that the best way by which to safeguard public safety? Because ultimately, that's the, the principal priority in terms of the, the licensing programme. And I don't have an absolute yes or no just now, but what I clearly would like to see, and I will commit and invest time in terms of doing it, is to ensure that that review goes wider than what happened previously, because we have a degree of time on our hands. We, we start to go into a rising demand again at the start of 2020. Um, so we need to have that review done, and we need to have the most efficient way to manage firearms licensing inquiries in place prior to us entering in to that period of rising demand, because that takes us clearly back up to the peak, which is around about 2021, mm -hmm. um, in terms of those inquiries and those uh, renewals. Would I be right in saying this time around you would collaborate more with Unison, who felt the first time they were sidelined, if you like? I, I, I would say, and I, I hope Drew would, would agree, that um, I think in 2018 we're a different service than we were in 2013-14 um, and absolutely the programme of modernisation the programme of change that's taking place in Police Scotland I think now is incredibly well informed and I think consultations at the heart of it I think one thing that uh, policing has gone public in terms of lessons learned is that perhaps we didn't engage as much as we should have uh, on many occasions and that's not coming from me as a superintendent, I think that's coming from my current chief constable who said that publicly. We have learned lessons in terms of our development. Uh, we are still relatively young in terms of that growth, but absolutely, uh, I think consultation is absolutely key because at the end of the day, that, that was the bedrock of policing in Scotland. We had, a, we had a strong tradition of consultation in the legacy forces and the SCDA. And absolutely, I think we're, we're now back in a position where it's at the heart of every conversation. 
Okay, thank you. Can I just very quickly ask a, a term that's been used a couple of times, demand failure. What, what does that mean? Failure demand is where you can't actually meet the expectations or the requirements to deliver um, what the, I hate to use the term customer, but certainly the people that you engage with, what they come to expect. And so that could be fail failure to act on what is specifically required. Um, for instance, having to do the same sort of work repeatedly um, would be an example of demand failure. Um, certainly, it's a term which is used quite consistently within C3 um, division. It's quite common there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just played some demand failure by not calling Ben, as I should have <laughs> prior to yourself, Rona. So I, I do apologise for that, Ben, please. Thank you. Good morning, Pam. First of all, I'd uh, just like to ask you, Nissen, whether setting up the dedicated units uh, in terms of correspondence with members has led to any of the members leaving Police Scotland and uh, or, or being moved into other roles within the service? Um, yes, there are still individuals that are still operating within the service. So obviously, the Scottish Government has that commitment to no compulsory redundancy, which is very welcome. However, that has caused some confusion around whether individuals were indeed made redundant within the structure, at which point we say it's not actually the individual, it's the post which has been made redundant. So um, there are still individuals working within the organisation, and there were individuals that were... Um, took the option of voluntary redundancy and voluntary early retirement. So, but there are still people within the organisation in other roles, which, whether they're entirely suited for those, we, we, it's not for us to argue that. Do you please call to comment on that point at all? Or? Yes, I mean, uh, re redeployment, and that was the term that was applied um, during that, that period of time. So there were people who were moved out of um, posts, um, that fell as a consequence of restructuring and change, uh, and that did happen. And, you know, the numbers I gave um, were accurate. We had 30, we had 33 full-time posts, but actually 34 m members of police staff who were undertaking firearms inquiry, uh, firearms inquiries on a full-time basis, and that was reduced to 14. Now, some of them did take uh, voluntary redundancy early retirement uh, when that was available during the phases of that, uh, and others moved on to other positions. Um, but, but I will reiterate the point that when that was happening, it wasn't to be replaced full time by police officers. This was a flexible model that was being introduced at that time um, to allow police officers to do community duties and do firearms inquiries, but not to do one at the exclusion of the other. Okay. Right. Mr Livingston, you're shaking your head. That's not strictly true. Um, there were email correspondence mm. which was sent out which basically was looking for officers to work full time as uh, firearms licensing coordinators um, and that happened in July 2015 mm. and those individuals are still in post. Uh, the posts were actually advertised looking for officers um, to take up those posts and initially it was advertised as between the hours of 8 to 4. Um, so they were effectively carrying out the role of the firearms inquiry officers. If you were to consider it um, in the scheme of, if you were to talk about a job evaluation scheme and whether those roles were perhaps 80% of the duty that those firearms inquiry officers were carrying out, you would have to say absolutely. Um, and they're still within that structure carrying out that role. Do you want to yes, I mean there there is a there is, there is a structure which has police officers now. At the time of the implementation of this model, we already had in place what were called divisional coordination units in all of the local policing divisions, and those divisional coordination units undertook the responsibilities for the administration or the flow of information and inquiries and tasks in relation to firearms licensing. Now, that's absolutely right within the governance structure. Local policing has a responsibility for the inquiries within their geographical areas. So those jobs absolutely were advertised, but they weren't advertised to do firearms inquiries. They were advertised to do the coordination roles within divisional coordination units, and they are still in existence. And some of those inspectors and sergeants who operate within those units are decision makers. 
Um, remember that the, the decisions taken to, to grant at divisional level are done by chief inspectors and some renewals are done by inspectors. So those were the roles that they were undertaking. Um, but they had a, a number of other roles or functions to fulfil as well. Those were not uniquely, um, it wasn't uniquely their role to do firearms licensing coordination. Okay, thank you. And, and just moving on to the, the review of firearms licensing that you have state that you're going to undertake in, in due course. Do you, are there any more details of that review that you can provide, uh, particularly uh, the timetable to complete it? No, that because that clearly has to go through our internal governance process first. It's on the improvement plan to do, um, and I've projected the date for completion to allow us to implement it before we go into that period of peak demand again. But clearly we're an organisation that has a large number of projects and programmes running just now as part of change and transformation. So I need to bid to find my slot within that and provide the strong business case um, to get the resource to actually conduct that review with the skill sets um, that are required to do that. Um, I suggest the convener may agree that it would be good to uh, keep the, co the committee informed and maybe un if you could undertake to today to, to do that in terms of the review. Yes, I, I, absolutely. I'm, I'm entirely happy to do that. There will be progress reporting in terms of the 23 recommendations, so uh, absolutely. Um, that part and parcel of that, I, I'm happy to undertake that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate you have to go here. Um, I have a few questions, um, gents, and, and rega with regard to that last discussion there, I, I, I thought there was a lot of similar ground to previous discussions we've had on the committee here with, for instance, custody suites and arrangements there. Now, I appreciate it's, it's not yourself, Mr McGoughan is, is taking these decisions, but it does seem to stem from the fact that police officers can't be made redundant, but police support staff were seen as being capable of uh, being made redundant, or whatever euphemism would be used for that term, given the no-redundancy policy. But I think it's important that, that we maybe move on. Can I ask about the localism, Mr McGoughan, and decision-making? Because I'm heartened to hear that, I have to say. It would seem to me that a central diktat about a format is inappropriate. Declare an interest as a former police officer who served, well, initially in this city, but for 27 years in, in the Highlands and Islands, where I have to say I did undertake firearms inquiries, not after a three-day course as well, I may tell you. But... Um, that, that discretion that's afforded there, there would seem benefit to me, and I certainly, and I don't suppose Mr. Livingston is suggesting that we'd deploy someone, for instance, to Barra from the mainland to undertake firearms inquiries when there are two officers there who could be trained. That would seem to be that it's going to be a, a mixed um, staffing of the resource. Would, is, is that the correct position? I, I think my, my view is very much it is. is about localism in, in, in its truest form. And, and you're absolutely right in terms of how you, 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 you've picked up that, that um, position about the, the challenges of geography. And absolutely, one size undoubtedly does not fit all here. I think that's the importance about having a service level agreement which uh, users understand and then standards which uh, local policing um, buy into in terms of delivery on. And how that's achieved absolutely is down to the geography, the diversity, and the challenging nature of each of those local policing areas. And I think that's the only effective way um, to deliver a service um, is through the provision of that, that autonomy back to local policing commanders. Okay, thanks. Mr Livingston, would you have a view that there will be a requirement for police officers to be used in some area? Absolutely. Um, we weren't hiding from the fact that, you know, it's not suitable for all areas. Certainly um, from discussions we had within the branch about processes within the former northern area, um, it didn't necessarily make logical sense that you would actually permanently station a member of police staff there. And certainly in larger geographies, yeah, I, I, I certainly believe that. But where you actually have... Um, firearms inquiry officers who are police staff that deal with a large number in of inquiries but could make it from one side of the division to the other and back again whilst carrying out a number of inquiries, why not use them? It's it's a cheaper alternative, it offers you consistency, stability. So yeah, it's we were always against the, the one size fits all um, precept that was put forward. And for the avoidance of any doubt, I wasn't suggesting, for instance, an area like the Highlands and Islands shouldn't have police support no. staff. I think we need to 
maximise the use of police officers for something that requires police powers rather mm -hmm. than, than other issues. Can I ask t two further issues, please? Um, and this is about um, when someone chooses not to renew their, their licence and the monitoring of what happens to the weapons. Can you give us a brief outline of that, please? And perhaps, and more importantly than that, issues around revocation of licence mm -hmm. uh, connected with behavioural. Yeah, I'm sure. So we, we have a very robust process in terms of monitoring. And um, I mean, I think that's increased significantly um, and continues to be a strong focus for us. Um, the, the GP process, which I, I think is an exemplar in terms of how it's been implemented in Scotland, uh, and indeed through conversations with colleagues down south, is very much the envy of many other forces, it is an example of our commitment to ensuring that public safety is paramount and that we do monitor um, all elements of a certificate holder's behaviour and a certificate holder's continuing suitability uh, to possess firearms, shotguns or air weapons. Um, in terms of... Uh, Revocations, yes, um, we have a, a number every single year uh, as a consequence of the actions of existing certificate holders um, or as a consequence of concerns raised by GPs, uh, and that's a positive indicator in terms of how that engagement's been carried out. Um, so, absolutely, it's an ongoing process. We introduced a new um, medium by which local policing officers could raise concerns uh, and report on information in terms of incidents they'd attended uh, where a certificate holder was present, um, not necessarily as uh, a culprit, but potentially even just as a victim, but where situations um, perhaps didn't best um, sit with the continuing um, possession of those firearms. And what we'll, we'll routinely do is work with the certificate holder to find a resolution in the short term. So we will have weapons removed and in the vast majority of cases we do. Um, and that, I have to say, on the vast majority of cases is done with the cooperation of the certificate holder. Uh, and they'll either be taken to a police station, but ideally they'll go with agreement to a registered firearms dealer and they'll be stored there until such time as that suitability is reconsidered. And then clearly following revocation, if the decision for revocation is taken, and that's a decision taken centrally by my team, um, then the individual has a right to appeal and it goes through a judicial process thereafter. Can I ask one point? I'm very loath to use the ICT um, uh, <coughs> or bring it into discussions, mm -hmm. but is, do you, are you content that your systems are robust enough to know that if someone were engaged in, I don't know, disorder or minor violence somewhere else, that, that would be, it would become apparent to Police Scotland that they are a firearm certificate holder? I think the one, the one issue we've got that has been, again, highlighted in the HMICS report is that uh, we have a, a STORM, which is our command and control system, which effectively manages all our incidents, our resource attendance, etc. And then we have SHOGUN, which is our firearms licensing system. Um, and currently, there is no interface between the two. Um, and that's one of the recommendations that came out. And again, we've had early discussions between national um, systems and Shogun, which was developed by a private software developer in terms of how we can create that interface. And effectively what that would do is then flag before the officers attend an address that there is a certificate holder or firearms present within that address. And I think absolutely when we get to that point, and I hope we do, that will again increase um, that robust uh, resilience and robustness around about that process. But I'm entirely satisfied just now. We've seen a significant increase in the number of concern reports that are coming in to us. Now, that's not because the behaviour of certificate holders has dramatically changed. That's because our ability to monitor and receive information has been enhanced. And I think the fact we have a national IT system where we can see wherever we are in the country, the details around about that certificate holder absolutely um, has assisted us in terms of that. Okay, that, that's reassuring. Liam, were you? Yeah, just on, on that point, um, at the moment, is there, is there a kind of manual workaround um, that, that exists that's part of the kind of processes or procedures that, that officers would, would go through? I mean, how, how does that work in the absence of the, the integration between those two there, systems? There is, there is no manual workaround, unfortunately. What it would require is that if an individual controller um, either had knowledge already of a certificate holder or firearms being present, or there was other, some other information um, that may lead to that being a concern, then clearly they have access to our firearms IT system 
and they can make the inquiry on that system. But, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be part of the the kind of triage process to to uh, uh, access Shogun um, in the way that you've mm -hmm. suggested, in order either to confirm what you already suspected or knew, yeah. or to um, uh, in, inform you as to the situation. Not, not unless there's something within the nature of the incident or the information that's forthcoming at the, at the outset of that. Um, that would indicate that that's a relevant inquiry to make. But no, it's not routine for every single incident to result in, in an inquiry being made on the Shogun system. Okay. Margaret? If I could just return to the business case, I know um, that Unison had uh, concerns that this didn't in fact reflect how the firearms licensing structure would function in reality. Now, today we've established that um, some of the, the roles um, for police staff uh, are now being backfilled by police officers. Who can give me the figures then of the implications of this? Is this something that SPA should have been on top of and have the, the figures for, or do Police Scotland have that, or Unison? Where would we get uh, this? I, I, I would assume Police Scotland would have to m monitor exactly what the costs are. I, I don't know. So in terms of how has the position changed since the implementation of the model in 2015, in terms of the number of um, police staff who are conducting firearms inquiries, we have 13 full-time, we had 14 in 2015. With respect, you've given me figures in terms yep. of personnel. What does that equate to in financial terms? Because if I understand you correctly, Mr Livingston, these police um, staff posts would come at um, not the same cost, a lower cost perhaps, in, yeah. in posts than uh, replacing it with backfilling a full-time police officer. So, so the, the police officer costs were, were, were fixed costs because of the establishment number we have in policing. Um, so that, that, that <clears throat> what I said was that the figures that <coughs> excuse me were, were presented um, back in 2014-15 were fairly clinical in terms of what they did. So what they did was they reduced the number of police staff, full-time firearms inquiry officers from the original number of 33 full-time posts down to 14. And what they said was that equated to a saving, and it was six hundred and fifty-three thousand three hundred and seventeen pounds. Um, but that position of the fourteen has only been reduced by one, um, and that was through natural um, wastage. At that, so so we've not reduced that number of fourteen any further. But the, there are more full-time police officers doing roles. There's more full-time probably Sorry. Co covered by police staff before. So is there a cost analysis? There are more full-time police officers trained. There are not, the, the demand hasn't changed. We're in a period of low demand. So there are some police officers who are carrying out firearms inquiries just now. But the number of trained police officers to carry those out are not all doing firearms inquiries. I, I would be very, and I think the committee would appreciate mm. some facts and figures on this, um, because it seems to me there's a little bit of a disconnect that perhaps I'm, I'm not fully appreciating it. If it was spelt out to see in business case terms how this e had equated and um, worked out in practice, I think that would be helpful. Mr Livingston, could you help me out here? In one particular division, I'm aware of three officers that are carrying out the role full time. And would that then, it, that would have been a, a police staff um, person uh, that would have done There were four members of police staff that were previously carrying out that function. And then that's sub supplemented by, uh, I believe, police officers and other fi firearms inquiry officers. I'd, I'd need to. Yeah, I, need to I think that, that goes to the, the heart of it. This was a savings. Um, a savings um, exercise. Um, certainly, that was one objective, a very main objective. And if that quite hasn't equated out as this has worked in practice, then it would be good to know that. And again, um, SPA should be here with the um, facts and figures at their fingertips because it was them or that organisation that was supposed to be monitoring the governance and how this was operating in practice. And again, I say, um, convener, they really should have been here. Yes, I, I think perhaps people listening and they have sent um, a, a written submission. It's not the most compelling piece of information I've read, but we, we did have it. I wonder, um, Mr McGoughan, if there are, um, and this perhaps predates your time, if there are relative figures for the cost of 
operating the firearm system, you know, from uh, at various points, so perhaps pre-13, 14, um, and, and the personnel that were engaged in that, something perhaps as, as simple as given, that's, that was the cost of the operation. Now, I appreciate the operation has expanded with the addition of, 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 of air weaponry, but if some, some figures of that nature, I don't think, uh, and the personnel involved, that would be helpful if, you, if that could be provided to the okay. committee. Thank you very much. And, and likewise, if you wish, wish to make a submission on that, that on specifics of that, Mr. Livingston. Okay. okay. Do committee members have any? Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Livingston, Mr. Mavokin, can I thank you very much for attending? That's been very helpful, and uh, we're now moving into private session. Thank you very much.